Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and I'm joined once again by Adam Taggart. Adam, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Mike. Uh, back here again, trying to fill Jeff Clark's prodigious shoes as host. Hope I do a good job. I'm sure you will. So what have you got for us this week? Well, we got a lot going on here. Um, we got our story of the day, tweet and charts of the day, and an excellent meme. So stick around for that, folks. But let's get started with the story of the day, Mike, which uh, this week is about what's going on in housing. Um, a couple of really interesting articles here, um, but largely we're seeing that the uh, a, a unprecedented number of people who are selling their homes into this market are not buying new homes as a result. Um, and uh, what this is leading to is basically a whole bunch more renters, which is putting a lot of pressure on rent prices. Um, so curious to see your thoughts. I know that uh, you've been watching this relatively closely. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, well, ultimately, it's a, <laughs> it's a very bad thing. One of the reasons why is because uh, there are market corrections. This does happen. And right now, we've got, you know, the Federal Reserve has been creating tons and tons and tons of currency. Uh, that currency has only inflated certain sectors. We're starting to see some of it come out into the retail sector, causing retail inflation, uh, you know, finally, because they've been creating currency for a long time now, massive quantities. And it's only been the past couple of months that we've seen it affect the retail market. It's been going toward real estate, the stock markets, bonds. It's been going into financial assets. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that will happen is there's always a correction when you, whenever anything gets manipulated, um, there there has to be some sort of correction eventually. The, the free market will overwhelm the manipulation, and you'll see a correction. When this crashes, this is Wall Street, and what it means is they will all get bailed out. And how do you? Th this is huge. This is in the many hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, and so the bailouts are going to have to be performed by creating more currency. I don't uh, see any place where they can just take the currency from. This is currency that will have to get whipped up out of nowhere to bail out uh, BlackRock and all of these other uh, funds and so on that are buying everything up. Um, so in the short term, uh, it's bad for uh, the consumers uh, because it's driving up the prices of homes. So if you own a home and you're selling it, you can make a profit. But then if you go to rent somewhere, your rent is going to be going up quickly along with the price of these homes. And if you try to buy another home, you had better find a place where the bubbles haven't started yet. But you know, toward the end of the Weimar hyperinflation, everybody got war rewarded for rampant speculation. And it was the, the people with the nuttiest uh, ideas, the stuff that would not have worked uh, before their central bank started creating massive amounts of currency, stuff that would not have worked turned out to be the thing with the greatest wealth transfer toward these hucksters and jokesters and people that were taking the public for a ride. What's your take on it? Well, when I asked if this was a, a good thing or a bad thing, that was a leading question, because obviously I've got an opinion on that. I agree with you that it's a bad thing. And it really comes down to, to two things. It comes down to uh, an affordability crisis, and it comes down to a loss of control and freedoms. And uh, you did a good job of explaining, you know, all this money that's sloshing into the system is unfairly going to the parties that are buying up all these, uh, these rental housing units. And year over year, we've seen the price of single family homes increase by 24%, uh, which is ridiculous. I don't know many households that can deal with a 24% increase in a major budget item like, uh, like housing. Uh, now rents haven't necessarily gone up that much, but they are certainly going up um, because in many cases, uh, the price of a house is supposed to be somewhat correlated to the income stream that you, you can rent it for. Um, and as we have more and more of these people who are selling their homes and not buying uh, a house that's increasing the pool of renters and that increases uh, the demand, uh, the rental demand for uh, a fixed supply of, of rental units. Uh, and that imbalance between supply and demand puts upward pressure on rents as well. And we have uh, some data coming up that, that actually shows how that's exploded over the, the past year. Um, but so that's obviously bad for people that 
you know, need to make rent every month. And then secondly, it's a loss of control, which is um, more and more of our housing supply is going to these massive investment firms like BlackRock and Vanguard. And it's really turning us not only to just a nation of renters uh, along the like, you know, you'll own nothing and be happy tagline that we're hearing about from uh, the, the Great Reset, um, but it's also turning us sort of into a company store nation where, you know, we're increasingly going to be working and renting uh, from the same big corporate overlords. And, uh, you know, once you once your house is owned by, you know, a hedge fund that owns, in some cases, maybe a number of the properties in the neighborhood that you live in, uh, you don't really have much recourse if you don't like the latest rental increase that they've they've put on you. Um, so it's increasingly sort of turning us into this feudal, this neo-feudal society in some ways. I mean, I think that's a really valid concern. And just to drive this point home, Mike, as we got on here today, before we started filming, you told me that the apartment that you're in right now is getting bought by a hedge fund, correct? Yes. Uh, I, you know, I owned three apartments down at the beach, but I did not like uh, one of them I was living in. And uh, I, I owned basically a third of, uh, or a quarter of the building and I was uh, going to be buying more. I just didn't like living in that area. And I found this place and it was going to be very temporary. I've been here for four years now, but uh, I, I, just, I didn't want to buy this place. So I leased it. And uh, now I've got uh, my farm. I've been referring it to it as my little farm and it's actually not so little. It's, it's uh, a, a pretty nice chunk of property with some great views and so on. And I'm going to be building up there. But right now, I'm just trying to re rehabilitate some houses that were tremendously damaged in the hurricane. And uh, one of them I want to live in as a temporary base camp while I'm finding the perfect spot to build my house and so on. And uh, uh, the, we can't get wind. The supply chain disruptions are crazy. We can't get windows and doors. But what I'm uh, afraid of now is I'm going to be going uh, while I'm in here. I've, I've, I have, you know, till the end of the year, basically. Uh, if I can't get windows and doors, I have to renew my lease and I'll be renewing it with this very cold, impersonal uh, hedge fund that is doing this as, you know, it's a formula. They've got a, a profit maximizing formula that's very cold. They don't really care about me or the fact that, uh, you know, I've, I've never been late on my rent, of course, and I've put a tremendous amount into, I mean, I've had this place rewired. <laughs> I've had a whole lot of work done on it that, uh, to improve it. Uh, and uh, they'll be getting all of that. Uh, but uh that isn't going to come back to me in, in goodwill as it did with my previous uh, landlord here. Uh, now, you know, the term landlord uh, comes from when we had a feudalism and all of the serfs lived on the Lord's property. And uh, the Lord, if, if, if the farming income you were generating, you know, you grow stuff and give a percentage of your crops to the farm. If that wasn't, if it wasn't generating enough and they could use it for something else, you were gone. And so you had no control. Uh, there is a loss of control that, that our society is going to be experiencing. But it's interesting that this has now spilled over into San Juan, Puerto Rico. You know, this was more of a mainland phenomenon, but now they're here gobbling up properties. And uh, <laughs> I may end up being, so I, I just hope that I can get doors and windows uh, be and, and have a place that I can move into before the end of the year, I might be making these videos out of a hotel room for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully not. But but the point is a very good one and really driving this home, Mike. And, and just to share a few stats with folks, you know, I, three years ago in 2018, the percent of single family homes that were bought by these hedge funds was like 2%. Now it's over 20%. So this phenomenon is really building a ton of momentum. And, and interestingly, we have the, um, the expiration of the eviction moratorium uh, that was passed uh, at the start of the, the pandemic here in the States. And some people think, well, okay, that might help the situation um, in terms of you're going to have some inventory coming onto the market as people get evicted. And obviously, it's a very sad thing that, that 
that's happening when people are getting evicted. Um, but I think what makes it even more sad is it's actually going to be a bonanza for these big firms where they're going to be swooping in and purchasing huge blocks of, of new inventory as these evictions bring new houses onto the market. And again, they, they, they can outcompete because of their deep pockets and their economies of scale, the regular mom and pop buyers who are just trying to, to find a place to live. So sadly, I think the situation is only going to get uh, magnified this year with the, uh, the end of the eviction moratorium. And, and just underscore the point that you made, Mike, which is, look, at some point, the success is going to um, bite them. And there's going to be some correction here, as you talk about, but they are highly likely going to get bailed out. So unlike regular investors, when you, you know, buy a home as an investment property and, and things, uh, the market turns on you, you know, you get to take your lumps. These guys are probably not going to have to take their lumps. So um, it's just, you know, all the things that we rail about government intervention, uh, power concentrating in, in the wrong hands and whatnot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just well, more. One that thing I'd like everybody to look at here is, you know, right now uh, we paid for them to do this to us through the Federal Reserve and the Treasury creating so much currency and uh, putting that out into the markets. Now, during a, if, if we have a melt-up, they're going to just make a huge profit on us. But we are also going to be, when, when it does correct and they do get bailed out, then we pay for it again. They don't pay for any of it. They just get to scoop up the profits. So we pay for it through inflation right now. And then when uh, they create a bunch of currency to bail them out, we're going to be paying for it through inflation and future taxation again. Classic example of the profits being privatized, but the losses being socialized. All right, Mike, well, let's move on to the tweet of the day here, which lo and behold is uh, a data point uh, showing exactly how rents have uh, really exploded uh, over just the past couple of years. So this is a tweet, um, it's actually a retweet uh, of Randy Olson's work by Ben Hunt, um, who is showing here that rents are rising quickly everywhere. Uh, the monthly price change in, in the 100 largest U.S. cities over the past four years. And you can see that in 2021, this year, almost every one of those 100 cities uh, has yep. increased its rent by over 3% or more. Your reaction, Mike? Uh, well, this looks, uh, it's not just 3% or more, is this month monthly price change. So this is 3% per month. This is huge. And you see that it's, there's, you know, going back to 2018, there's never been anything like this. Uh, these last um, uh, five months have just, it's so red, uh, it's insane, 3% per month. Uh, it, it prices everybody, you know, um, somebody, one person might say, well, great, I own a home. So these are the gains I'm making. The next person is working really hard to put a couple of kids through college. And those, those two, his, his son and daughter need to buy a starter home yeah. and they'll never be able to do that. Uh, and this is caused by the Federal Reserve. Uh, and now, uh, you know, if this continues, uh, it will be all of these big funds and, and uh, investment firms uh, making all the gains out of this. If they're buying 20% of the homes on the market, uh, that is enormous. Uh, really, really well said there, Mike. Um, I think everything that we're talking about today, you know, the societal undertones of what's going to happen if this continues uh, are just, um, you know, downright depressing, um, you know, if not just criminal. Uh, not that I know exactly how it's all going to end, but, um, you know, we, we really are building a societal tension here with just mounting and mounting unfairness for the bottom 99%. Um, all right, well, let's move on to the chart of the day, which um, uh, we'll put up the chart here. But, but Mike, you're actually going to do a full video dedicated to what you intended to be the chart of today, correct? Yeah, uh, there's, there's a, a chart that we were going to cover, but there's a whole bunch of other charts that relate to it. So I'm going to do a separate video on that. But this chart here is one of the most brilliant that I have ever seen. <laughs> You know, they got the two scales here, rabbit, duck, and you got to look at this thing and then look at it, twist it so that uh, the, the bottom part is rabbit and, and, and the vertical scale is duck. 
<laughs> you can see <laughs> that with some charts, you only see what you want to see. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it, 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 I, I think the chart speaks for itself. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it, we've got so many issues going on today where um, intelligent people can look at the same data but come to completely opposite conclusions. And that's certainly not helping the national dialogue right now where, you know, everybody is 100% convinced that, that they're seeing the rabbit or the duck and not, uh, not keeping an open mind that there might be a different way to look at the data. Um, all right, folks, well, look, if you are enjoying this video, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Uh, we're almost at the meme of the day, but before we get there, I just wanna uh, read a little bit of subscriber feedback uh, that we've received since last week. Um, this is related, Mike, to uh, the inflation that, that's been running rampant this year. You know, will it be transitory or not? Who knows? But here's what user Stacy Nodge has to say. Uh, anyone who does the regular shopping knows inflation is rampant. My Mercangelo sausages went from $10 to $12. That's 20% for the math challenged. So, you know, Stacy is definitely seeing, uh, you know, feeling the bite of inflation. Uh, that's the result of all of the excess uh, liquidity and stimulus that uh, both monetary and fiscal that's been flooding into the system. Uh, this is not theoretical for folks anymore, Mike. It's really hitting them in their pocketbooks. What's your reaction? Uh, yes. Well, you know, one thing I noticed was that uh, during the height of the lockdowns back in early 2020, mid 2020, um, Beef, the, the grocery cost of groceries didn't go down. It didn't deflate, even though velocity slowed, the economy slowed, uh, um, you know, prices of uh, real estate and rents probably went down. I don't have that data in front of me right now. But uh, the prices at the grocery store, you know, I, I take a look at, um, at, at beef and how much it costs per pound for a New York steak or a ribeye. And, uh, uh, what I noticed was that it was flat during the uh, height of the lockdowns and then suddenly jumped 20%. Uh, it, you know, th that 20% has stuck. It, it, it isn't uh, going down. And you said uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, the monetary policy stimulus, everything that the Federal Reserve does on its own uh, <clears throat> is... Uh, what went into the stock markets and, and inflated asset prices, uh, stock market, real estate, and bonds. Uh, the fiscal stimulus is done through the government, so the, it, it can be funded by currency creation, but it's deficit spending by the government. You receive a stimulus check, it's when all of that started to happen that we saw retail inflation. We didn't see, we only saw inflation in asset prices when it was just the Fed. But once the government got involved in handing out free currency, <laughs> we're seeing that all come back to haunt us. And the way that free currency was paid for is through the inflation tax. Yeah, and, and you know, completely correct, Mike. And as you sort of said earlier about the stickiness of these prices, it sort of reminds me like the airline industry, right? Whenever oil prices get high, they roll out new fees or new limits. Um, as a justification, hey, you know what, we got to start charging you for your baggage, um, or we're going to have less space in the plane or whatever. And it's positioned like, just to get through this, this period of high oil prices, and then we'll go back to the way it was before. But lo and behold, oil prices go down. And those new fees, those new limitations, they never go away, right? So, you know, Jerome Powell was asked at his co press conference last week, about whether he, you know, thought, inflation was indeed going to be transitory or not. And he said, yes, we think it's going to be transitory, but then he sort of changed the definition of transitory. And he said, it doesn't mean the prices are ever going to come back down. Um, we just think there's going to be less inflation on top of it going forward. So, you know, even Jerome Powell is sort of admitting that the, the, the price increases we've seen are not going to be rolled back here. Um, and, and one other thing I just want to note here too, is, is that's just on you know, the implications of, of the policy side of things. But there are other elements out there that can make the situation even worse that aren't on most people's radar screens. And for example, I live in California. And right now, uh, folks are all of a sudden realizing that these, these new regulations, which, you know, I think are for a good reason, uh, are designed to give animals more space uh, when they're being raised, you know, in farms and, and whatnot, um, 
but but pigs and chickens in particular, uh, the price of bacon and poultry products is set to spike here in California. And again, California is a huge um, producer of, of meats for the rest of the country. Um, and, and that's a complication that's being added on top of just the regular stimulus-induced price inflation that you and I are talking about. So, you know, the outlook here doesn't look great. And as I always sort of end when I have these little rants is we've just talked about food inflation that's in the double digits. We talked earlier about housing and rent inflation that's in the double digits. And we're talking double digits year over year. I don't know how many households can absorb that. Like how much longer can the regular person absorb all this, Mike, before the pitchforks and the torches come out? They can't. And when you see inflation statistics that it's, uh, you know, annualized at five and a half percent, that's the CP lie. So, yes, you're talking about double digits pretty much everywhere. Uh, the CP lie is not an accurate inflation gauge. One of the things they do in the CPI is they calculate housing prices by trying to figure out how much would a house cost if an owner rented from himself, not if he owned the house. Right. <laughs> so it isn't tracking the price of houses. Uh, so uh, they do some silly stuff like that and they call it an, an inflation uh, statistic and, and it's just a lie. Uh, but what uh, the important thing is, is that uh, for the average person, if they aren't making a double digit increase in their wages or their salaries, uh, they're falling behind. Their income, their di real disposable income is going down at a very rapid rate. Uh, and this causes a wealth transfer. This is caused by currency creation that dilutes the currency supply. This uh, loss of purchasing power was given to somebody else by the Federal Reserve. Right. And this is, it just goes to the heart of the reasons for why owning precious metals, right? It's one way to protect against this erosion of the purchasing power of yes. our wealth that, that we're all being inflicted with. All right, Mike, well, we got to get to the meme of the day here real quickly before we do. Folks, if you haven't yet, make sure you download a free copy of Mike's excellent book on how to invest in gold and silver. Just go to goldsilver.com slash free book. And Come watch the uh, macro weekly interviews that I do at Wealthion.com and come this week and subscribe because our guests running later today, uh, videos running later today, are Mike Maloney with a presentation that's never been seen in public before, uh, followed by a special bonus presentation by Jeff Clark on how to invest in the mining stocks that he thinks are most interesting and have the greatest prospects right now. Uh, so to watch those, head over to youtube.com slash Wealthion. All right, Mike, let's end here on the meme of the day. Now, uh, there's been a lot of blowback uh, in recent weeks against uh, the billionaires who are going up into space, uh, Bezos um, and uh, Richard Branson and whatnot. Um, and there's another side to that story. So uh, as you set up the meme here, why, why don't you give us your thoughts well, on this story? Yeah, you know, um, uh, back in the day when the Wright brothers built bicycles, there was a saying that if mankind was meant to fly, he would have been born with wings. And so here's the meme, selfish jerks. They wasted their resources doing this instead of making bikes for people in need. <laughs> so <laughs> for all of the socialists out there, had it not been for this selfish waste, we would have never had commercial flight. I want to thank everybody for watching. Thank you, Adam. Pleasure, Mike. Thank you.